Do you smell that? I detect the scent of change in the air. You've been with me for three story chapters so far, as I've attempted to beat this game in a manner that no sane person ever would. By failing every mission objective, you've watched as I have persevered, even though I was forced to complete at least one mission objective in each of the first three story chapters. But this, this time feels different. And this time, more than any other, is dedicated to you dedicated fans who have cheered me on since part one. But is what I smell really success or, um, failure? Or is it the sense of Pearson's mystery meat stew blending together with this malodorous swamp? I don't know, but I can smell it. Begin! You were good at this! Well, uh, it's good, everybody. And welcome to Saint Denis. This city was a model of economic prosperity in 1899. The people here are so well off, even the beggars are giving away free money out of their hats. It was at this moment I knew I misread this fellow's intentions, and he was, in fact, asking for money. I took his unconscious body to the rich part of town and dumped him on someone's porch. Everybody knows rich people are the friendliest you'll ever meet. I'm sure they'll help him out. I should stop messing around and get to the task at hand. Jack has been kidnapped, and Dutch has suggested I ask around at saloons in town to discover some clues as to his whereabouts. This trustworthy drunkard tells me the kids in Yali know how to find Mr. Bronte, whom we believe is holding Jack hostage. I go to the alley, and I discover two people on a date. If you're feeling sick, you're not nauseous, you're nauseated. The only thing making me nauseated about this is the fact that this man has challenged this woman to a contest to see who can hold this pose the longest. It takes a real alpha male to challenge a woman to a test of strength. Bravo, my dude. I managed to track down one of the kids who encourages me to stay close. Arthur's ADD kicks in as he sees a mission failure condition lurking down a side street. Stay close. Easy to get lost around here. I really should have avoided the kids at all costs. Not only did they steal my money, thus forcing me to steal drinking money from these patrons instead of chasing the kid, but they also lured me into an alley alone with them. It's a little known city ordinance that only two groups of people can be alone with kids in an alley, and which two groups might those be, you ask? Papists and rapists. And since I don't fit into either one of those groups, I broke the law. But the kids did prove useful in the end as they gave me the location of Bronte's house. I catch up with Dutch and John and we confront him about kidnapping Jack. He says we can get the kid back if we deal with some grave robbers for him, so I go with John on a stealth mission to the graveyard. He should know by now that stealth and this run do not mix. Keep it down. Don't want him to bolt on us. I can think of better ways to spend an evening. With the robbers dealt with, we return to Bronte. He invites us to a party, and we secure Jack. John joins me for a celebratory swim, which terrifies his son since he knows his dad is allergic to water. But the rest of the gang is so happy John finally learned to swim, they broke into song. The next day, Susan tells me Tilly has been taken hostage by the Foreman brothers. She encourages me to go quickly to Tilly's location, so off we go. Can't you go any faster? We lost the horse! I just hope we can get to her in time. Since the railroad track was obviously no good, I tried taking a shortcut through camp. But apparently Pearson established a no wagons in camp rule following the events of chapter three. <laughs> he ever actually even talked to a woman he ain't paid for? Susan and I do eventually catch up to the Foreman brothers after a high speed chase, or at least a chase. I thought you were meant to be good at this. I skip ahead to the point of catching Anthony Foreman, and I had a little accident while trying to do him a favor. Get these ropes off of me right now! Back at the cabin, I was slightly worried I would have to use a lifeline for the choice of killing him or sparing him, but then I found out Arthur will kill him by default even if I didn't choose either option. So. No need for a lifeline. Next, the boys accept Bronte's party invitation and try high society. At the party, Bronte gives us a tip that there's money at the trolley station in the city. He implies that if we rob it, he'll conveniently look the other way. What a swell guy. Go enjoy yourselves and mingle with this vulgar scum. It'll make you long for the days when you could shoot each other and screw cows out on the open range. <laughs> Those sure were the days. We go mingle with the party guests to see if we could find out more information on places to rob. I don't drink personally, so I try to fit in by escorting a drunk guest through the crowd. They 
Didn't like that very much. Dutch sent me inside to spy on a servant who was in communication with Leviticus Cornwall. Instead, I got sidetracked by what I smelled cooking in the kitchen. You can't be in here, sir. Please return to the party. I won't ask again. Security! Security! And after I got kicked out, I made my way to the buffet table outside, even though Dutch said it was time to go. Following the party, the idea for three major robberies are born. One is, of course, the trolley station, one is the riverboat, and one is the biggest of all, the Santini Bank. I start with the riverboat. This mission made me nervous for a few reasons. One of which is the sequence at the beginning where you have to buy the suit. I thought this would be like buying the horse from Chapter 2 all over again. But as it turns out, if you don't follow Trelawney into the tailor, you can skip the checkpoint outside and skip purchasing the suit altogether. What comes after that did give me some trouble unexpectedly. You have to follow Trelawney to the next destination, and the game limits your ability to move away from him. It also restricts your access to things like the weapon wheel and the satchel. After a few moments of trial and error, I found out if I followed him across the street and then turned around and walked back toward the tailor, it would fail the checkpoint. I also thought the haircut sequence would be its own checkpoint, which the game would force me to complete. I found out I could fail the checkpoint before setting in the barber's chair and thus skip the haircut completely. Next, I tried to skip the card game by abandoning ship, but Rockstar's infinite wisdom in their game design says there will be no foreshadowing here as I fail the mission for jumping overboard. What I find out is that isn't enough to skip the card game. Fortunately for me, even with Strauss trying to help me cheat, I still found a way to skip this section by folding. This causes Desmond to storm off. Pleasantly surprised, I skip ahead to the escape sequence where we leave the boat by <clears throat> jumping overboard. Shocker. The next mission begins as a quiet day in camp. That is, until Kieran decides to pull a practical joke on all of us by riding into camp while holding his decapitated head between his hands. <laughs> what a jokester! The problem is no one else is laughing when the O'Driscoll starts shooting at us. I bravely charge forward and distract the enemy by running around in circles. Sure, it's an unusual tactic, but it buys me enough time to fail the mission by not retreating in time, so I'll take the W. Once I skip ahead to the point where I'm inside the house, it's total chaos. Dutch has his usual awful choice of music playing, which isn't helping. I try to shoot the gramophone, but the darn thing is indestructible. Then, in a moment of panic, I lose my head and decide the best course of action is to make a donation to the camp lockbox. Lucky for me, it wouldn't open despite my attempts to shoot the lock off. After all, I didn't spend all that time letting the gang donate to give in now. I was in the process of bringing this part of the narrative to a conclusion when Sadie decided to steal the show. Somebody please give this woman the right to vote before she kills us all. I meet Dutch and Lenny near the trolley station in Saint Denis. We're going to follow through on that tip from Bronte and rob the place. Turns out the robbery was a setup, and the law converged on the building in minutes. This mission may not present any unique scoring opportunities, but it does give us a moment that leads to a popular fan theory. The theory goes that Dutch's mental state begins to gradually deteriorate after hitting his head when the trolley crashes. Now, I'm no psychologist, but I can confirm that this is a poor tactic for evading the law. Get the hell off of me. Was the measly take from this robbery enough to make it worth it? We each got $15 and a quarter. Don't forget the quarter. <laughs> Heck yes it was. I head back into the city after robbing it, which is a questionable choice. But while I'm in there, I meet Rain's Fall and his son Eagle Flies talking with Evelyn Miller. They explain to me the United States government is encroaching on their land and trying to force them to move because it's believed they have oil reserves underneath the reservation. They offer to pay me money if I help find proof the army is acting unethically, and I accept. I meet Eagle Flies near the oil fields. He tells me I'm looking for a document in the upstairs office of the main building and that I have to sneak on board a wagon in order to enter the facility. Quick before someone spots us. Once inside the office, I thought I would have to use my lifeline to get past interrogating Mr. Danbury. But after some experimentation, I discovered I get access to my weapon wheel after I interrogate him. So crisis averted and mission cleared. Back at camp, Dutch is angry about being set up by Bronte during the trolley station robbery. He hatches a plan to sneak onto Bronte's property at night by boat. Dutch and I set out on what would have been a quiet ride through the country had he not tried to engage me in polite conversation. Thank you. For what? We meet up with Thomas, and he agrees to row us to Bronte's house, but he needs our help first. His friend Jules is lost in the swamp. We find Jules, and he's raving about a monster being on the loose, so he's obviously been drinking and is delusional. 
He even gets out of the boat and drowns. <laughs> what a little rascal. But things get real when the figment of his imagination chews my face off. That is not the way we do things. Having secured our boat ride, we decide the time is right to move on Bronte. I start by increasing my stealth skill. I know I'm ready to start the mission when Dutch doesn't even see me until I walk up to him at the dock. Arthur, there you are. We fight our way into Bronte's house and take him hostage. I notice on the way out that cops sure are shooting at him a lot for someone who runs the city. In hindsight, he probably would have preferred the bullet. The fateful day has finally come. With Bronte out of the way and the O'Driscolls aware of our camp's location, now is the perfect time to hit the Sandini bank. Everyone knows their roles. Hosea and Abigail will create a distraction. My fellow gang members will enter the bank and complete the robbery. My job is to not do anything stupid. Dutch promised to remind me of this once the robbery kicked off. stupid! Now, in my defense, I had been holding on to that fire bottle since burning the Gray's tobacco fields. All I was doing was getting rid of it since it's a fire hazard and thus unsafe to carry around. We are almost home free when we see the Pinkertons outside and they have a prisoner. Hosea has permanently failed his final checkpoint. R.I.P. We use our remaining dynamite to blow a hole in the side of the bank. I'm told to get up to the roof and provide covering fire. The problem is, it's so loud that I misunderstand Dutch. I could have sworn I heard him say, run straight past all the Pinkertons and we'll follow you because we don't want to go to Guarma. Once I finally made it to the roof, I promptly fell off. I climbed back up and knew what was about to go down. It was either me or Lenny, and I couldn't bear to see a second gang member bite the dust in five minutes. I did what I had to do, and... Turns out if you skip this checkpoint, you never see Lenny die. Well, that's gotta be awkward if anybody ran across this scenario on their first playthrough. We assemble on a nearby rooftop and Dutch begins to lead us to our hiding place. We gotta keep quiet and keep moving or we're gonna be dead in the next few minutes. Follow me, one at a time. Arthur, you go next. We gotta keep moving, quick and quiet. Once hidden, we decide our only option is to eat Micah while we wait for the cops to stop looking for us. By the time we're done, we'll probably be too fat to be recognized by them anyway. Seriously, the guy's got a pot belly and should really consider a more balanced exercise routine. References to cannibalism aside, we go to sneak out of town on a boat. We go through the streets, virtually undetected by the police, which is the same thing as drawing loads of attention to ourselves. What are you doing? We manage to get on the boat when our situation goes from bad to worse. Our ship goes down in the ocean and we wash up on a remote island. It's at this point I'm thankful for two things. Number one, chapter four has not technically ended yet. And number two, I still have a lifeline to use for chapter four. So whether we consider walking on the beach an interactive cutscene, or if we say that I have to use a lifeline to skip it, either way, it doesn't impact my score. I clear the beach and my first perfect chapter is complete. 11 main story missions, every mission checkpoint skipped successfully. It was the perfect failure. Well, next I guess we're gonna get shot. Come on, Arthur! I'm glad I was able to present this part to you. I intend to sprinkle in different videos between episodes of this series going forward, like I've done for a few months now. I have a full-time job outside of YouTube, which is keeping me very busy at the moment, and I'm trying to get new content out as quickly as my schedule allows. Consider checking out one of the videos on the end screen if you haven't already seen it, and until next time, make it count.